Protests took place across the country over the weekend following the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse, who was found not guilty on all five charges he faced after he fatally shot two men and injured another during a night of unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin last year. Let's take a look. State of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. As to the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we the jury find the defendant Kyle H. Ritt Kyle H. Rittenhouse not guilty. The jury reached the correct verdict. Self-defense is not illegal. And I believe they came to the correct verdict and I'm glad that everything went well. And it's been a rough journey, but we made it through it. The verdict doesn't come as a big surprise to many legal experts. One defense attorney and former prosecutor told NPR, quote, I think anyone who saw the evidence could see that the jury may have a difficult time coming to a unanimous decision that Kyle Rittenhouse wasn't defending himself. Public defender for the Legal Aid Society and political commentator Alaimi Alurin and professor of law at Baltimore law, School of Law author and legal analyst Kim Whaley are with us for Team Rising. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Good to be here. So, oh, I mean, what's your reaction to uh, to the verdict and some of the, you know, the, the media coverage, I, I think, was initially uh, made a, a little misleading or, or, or primed audiences, especially in the mainstream media, uh, to, to maybe expect that this was kind of a slam dunk case. And then obviously we saw, as the case unfolded, we saw, you know, evidence uh, emerging or a testimony emerging that was a lot more favorable uh, uh, to Rittenhouse. What, what's your reaction? Well, I wasn't surprised by the verdict, but I do think that the verdict makes a mockery of the doctrine of self-defense, and I think it goes against our modern understanding of self-defense. This idea that you can illegally obtain a gun, go to a place you have no business being, where people are exercised in their First Amendment rights to protest police brutality, a movement that by all intents and purposes you don't appear to support, to act in a manner you have no authority to act, to act as security for buildings and for businesses that you've never been to, that you don't work for in a community that it, a community that you don't live in. And then when you kill multiple people in the process, you then get to say that you were afraid. You know, a person who goes to an event armed with an AR-15 to act voluntarily as security quite literally assumes a risk. They've prepared for violence. They don't get to then say they're afraid. And I think there's something to be said about the fact that no one but Rittenhouse killed anyone at this protest, despite the fact that it was supposedly so dangerous, so out of control, and the protesters are being characterized as such. No one killed anyone but him. There's been a lot said about Rosenbaum, you know, acting erratically throughout the night, and yet no one else harmed him. Acting erratically, having a mental health episode isn't cause to kill someone, even if they chase you. Any New Yorker who's ever ridden the subway a day in their life could tell you that. That situation could not have become fatal without Rittenhouse. And I think this decision opens the gate to this kind of violence at protests and legitimizes it. The idea that an unarmed man acting erratically can be shot to death and the grounds will be that the person with an AR-15 says it's self-defense because what if they took my gun? There's nothing that was presented to us throughout the trial that says that Rittenhouse's, that Rosenbaum's intention was to tackle Rittenhouse, retrieve the weapon he had strapped to him, then turn it on him and shoot him to death. And I think, you know, we have to talk about how much effort and work goes into keeping these protests peaceful. Black Lives Matter became the largest civil rights movement in the country last year with over 550 different places in the country having protests at the time. And in all those protests and all those different locations, no Black Lives Matter protester killed a single soul. And in he comes and he kills someone. And I think we have to so talk about what that means. widespread destruction. I mean, things, there was vandalism, there was fires, there was uh, destruction of property. There, there was a lot of... You know, no one, thankfully, no one was murdered, but there, there was a lot of destruction, right? <laughs> widespread, widespread destruction of buildings and property does not rise to the level of murder. It does not rise to the same level of a threat at a protest that someone with a gun and kill somebody does. Hey, uh, Kim, Alimi's point is an interesting one. Let, so let, and let, let's, let's pick up on her analogy of, on the, the New York subway, because Samuel Alito recently said, hey, you know, maybe the Second Amendment says you should be able to take whatever weapon you want onto the New York City subway. So let's say that you do take an AR-15 on, onto the subway. And like Alimi said, anybody who's ridden that subway knows that 
you know, in, in every, you know, say 10th car or so, you're going to encounter somebody, you know, who, who may be going through some type of uh, mental health crisis. And, and that, that those chances seem to have gone up since the pandemic and since the collapse of kind of wraparound services in, in the city have exacerbated the, the mental health crises that we see playing out on the streets of New York. So now you're on the, you, you brought this weapon onto the subway. Now this, uh, this guy going through this episode comes near you. You genuinely now are concerned that he's going to take the gun from you. You shoot him and kill him. Are, are, do we want that to be legal? Do we, like, we are still a democratic society, right? Like, can we decide that there are laws that we want to prevent a situation like that being perfectly legal? Yeah, so I did actually a piece for The Hill on Friday on that very issue that is uh, that this is really a clash between Wisconsin's open carry law and the law of self-defense. And the judge here threw out the open carry related uh, charges against Mr. Rittenhouse. So the, the question of whether he was properly wielding an AR-15 um, under the law was taken off the table for the jury. So um, the, Mr. Rosenbaum, the first victim, threw a plastic bag filled with toiletries at him and did chase him. The second, the second victim, Mr. Huber, had a skateboard. So we're talking plastic bag skateboard against an, a semi-automatic weapon. And as indicated, um, self-defense now, I think the jury was persuaded that Mr. Rittenhouse was concerned, reasonably concerned, over his safety and that the gun would be turned on him and that this kind of uh, sort of aggressive actions with a, with a skateboard and a plastic bag put him in some kind of threat. The fact that there's an open carry law, in my mind, it's hard to even imagine a circumstance where self-defense uh, would not work now. That is, it was the prosecution's burden and Mr. Rittenhouse sobbed on the stand. He also had $2 million of defense money behind him. Um, that most of the vast majority, the millions of, of Americans who are, who are arrested and go through the criminal justice system, disproportionately piece of people of color, don't have the money to have two mock jury trials in which you try out testifying and you try out not testifying and decide which went better. In this instance, Mr. Rettenhouse's testimony went better with the fake juries. And so they put that in front of the real juries. I mean, access to money is a tremendous advantage in our legal system, unfortunately, both criminally and civilly. So there's a lot that went into this, but I agree. Um, so long as we have really uh, liberal gun laws, I, I just don't see how, how the, the normal access to self-defense traditionally is gonna function. And as you mentioned, the Second Amendment is on the table this fall in the United States Supreme Court, and the court will decide whether as a matter of the Second Amendment, there is a right to carry firearms outside of the home. That is, can states regulate that? If the court finds it's not re regulatable, that is, states have no right limiting access, um, then we're in a much, much more dangerous can, society. Can, can't safety. they, going to, going to what you said, right? can't they, re let, let's regulate mentally ill people on the subway. Like, let, let's not have no. mentally ill people on the subway. I, think, I mean, that's the you, first no, order problem. No. Yeah. You, that you can't. You should. They, like the, no, the, go, the no. government should absolutely police no. or whatever resource mental health resources should be made available so there aren't mentally ill people on the side. Like that's a there huge are, problem on its own without any bringing guns into it. Mental illness and mental health issues is far more common than the way that we discuss it, right? It is not this occasional boogeyman or this completely erratic person in which you say. People in New York City, people all around have all kind of mental health issues and they're not just the people where it's glaring to you and we can't use an analogy to express how wild, you know, the possibility to the slippery slope from a verdict to suggest that we more heavily re like regulate and stigmatize mentally ill people. My, ana my analogy was meant to put forward this reality. People ride the subways, they see people like this, they see people like Rose and bomb and what was described and those encounters go off without anybody being killed people go about their business because they didn't have a weapon they have no reason to resort to violence and what we're really talking about is how this incentivizes violence not a cause to regulate mentally ill people and yeah. and Eli, I mean, let me let me put this scenario to you as well let's say that there are only two people on the subway or there are only two people in an elevator or only two people in a parking garage one of them is open carrying uh, and shoots and kills the other one. There's now no video, there's nothing else. Are we in a scenario where the presumption is that this person just walks? I think so. 
I think it creates that. You know, I think it creates the possibility of that. The self-defense argument that would have seemed unlikely seems very possible. And I think people will factor that into their decision-making processes, especially when you think of it in terms of protest, right? People who weren't inclined to use violence or maybe worried about how the law would respond will think, you know what, there's a chance that I could get away with this. Maybe it's better for me to act violently first. You know, shoot first, ask questions later, because I will say that I was afraid. And that's maybe my concern. Maybe people will feel safer if they have a weapon in a scenario where a mentally ill person is screaming at them or confronting at them or getting aggressive with them. I'd like the, pe Listen, the, the people answer, at the, the answer for mental illness is treatment. The answer is is, is treatment. I, I, like, I, I, mean, I agree. That, that, that's, that's a totally that's... separate issue than people dying in violence and guns. I just right. don't think they're I don't think you're gonna, by regulating mental health you're gonna somehow yeah. prop, I, I, solve I don't the I don't I don't think violence. I don't think the American people need to uh, should be forced to accept like just being assaulted or screamed at by crazy people in the public. Right, I'll just well, say that. Again, yeah. totally, totally separate issue. Yeah, I know, know it is separate by, by a 17 year old who, who has, what didn't, shouldn't have the gun, didn't know how to use the gun, didn't understand the, the bullets in the gun. I mean, this is about human safety. This is about the, the sanctity right. of life. There's no reason you need to bring guns to a peaceful protest. And let's face it, if this was a stop the seal rally, and this was an African-American person with an AR-15, it would have ended very, very differently. There's just, there, there's no I mean, way I around. I wouldn't have felt any like, differently about, about the case. Maybe uh, maybe other people commenting it on it would have. Yes, we should, that, like, that would be absolutely, and the behavior that went on at uh, January 6th and all those other things, you, yeah, absolutely people should but be I, held accountable but for I think it. But conservatives but I think should care about First Amendment it. rights, safety of protests, First Amendment rights and safety. That's, and that's the issue. <laughs> Yeah. And I also think that says something, right? The people that actually attend these protests, whose cause it actually is, whose movement it is, do not feel that way, right? They see people that have mental health episodes. They see them there. They didn't feel the need to resort to this kind of violence. They didn't feel to have a call to how we regulate who attends there. I attend Black Lives Matter protests. I don't know about the rest of you. And if I see somebody mentally ill or I'm going through a mental health episode, I am not inclined to fear for my life or to want them removed or to be concerned about them being able to attend these protests or to think that, you know, having an armed weapon would make this safer. That is precisely the the opposite of how I feel. And I think that is how the people who actually attend these movements and who actually should be there and had cause to be there feel. We're out of time, so we're gonna have to pick up that discussion later. Thank you so much for being with us. And we'll be back with more Rising right after this.